Well, welcome. Well, we are in a series called At the Movies, and, and as we've been looking at this series, we've been looking at the, the seeds of the gospel that, that are really all around us, but in particular in these movies that we watch, these, these big uh, you know, blockbuster movies that we watch, maybe, uh, you know, maybe if you're a more sophisticated movie watcher and you, and you say, I only watch indie films, uh, you know, we even see the seeds of the gospel in there, the seeds of the good news. We can see that, that God is still speaking to us and through us and, and about us and the stories that we watch all around us. Because we looked at last week that Jesus used stories, and he used stories of, of things that the people would have known about to, to teach about how the kingdom of God was, was all around them, and how the kingdom of God was at work, and how the kingdom of God was bringing to them good news. And as we look at, at many of our, our popular films, we can see how God is, is still at work in our culture. We can see how these movies even mirror back to us how we view the human condition, how we view what it is to be human. And, and sometimes these movies even speak to us and reveal God to us. And so that's the premise of our, our message series. And today we're going to look at a passage of scripture that's actually one of the, the parables that Jesus taught in a great trilogy about lost things, because Jesus liked trilogies too, in uh, Luke chapter 15. And Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 1, and we'll also have it on the screens. And I'll be reading from the message translation. It says this, by this time, a lot of men and women of doubtful reputation were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. And the Pharisees and the religious scholars were not pleased, not pleased at all. And they growled. He takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. And their grumbling triggered this story. Suppose one of you, Jesus is speaking, suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and you lost one. Wouldn't you leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the lost one until you found it? And when you found it, you can be sure you would put it across your shoulders rejoicing. And when you got home, call in your friends and neighbors saying, celebrate with me. I have found my lost sheep. Count on it. There's more joy in heaven over one sinner's rescued life than over 99 good people and no need of rescue. Well, it's summertime here in Texas, if you haven't noticed with all the heat. And so with summertime comes, of course, you know, beaches, road trips, and summer movies, right? And not just any summer movies, but this is the time of the summer blockbuster movie, which means the summer superhero movie. And so already this year, you know, in May, we had Guardians of the Galaxy 2, and now we have you know, Wonder Woman reigning supreme at the box office. And in two weeks, we're going to have Spider-Man Homecoming that comes out as our July big movie. And, and they're already projecting, you know, a hundred million dollar opening for, for Spider-Man. I mean, these are the kind of movies that, that we love to go watch and that we go and see. And they make tons of money for studios and they love to see them. But we just love the superhero movie. And there's just something about the superhero movie. There's just something about, you know, watching these heroes with these fantastic powers and these, you know, devious supervillains and, and, you know, kind of a, a, a rescue beyond rescues. You know, maybe we're, we're saving the world or we're saving the universe or, or maybe we're even just saving a couple of people. But whatever it is about these stories, we love the stories about heroes. And although we can watch these, these movies, you know, like Guardians of the Galaxies that have talking trees and talking raccoons and, you know, and gallivanting through space, or we, you know, watch a movie like Wonder Woman, which is great, by the way, and uh, we can see Wonder Woman, you know, kind of turning the tide in World War I, you know, as we wish, you know, we had superheroes like that, or, or maybe you, you can watch even a movie like Spider-Man and see him, you know, kind of swing around and, you know, and just kind of look forward to all that we're going to see there, you know, kind of even a team up with Iron Man. I know a lot about these movies, by the way. And so, looking forward to them. This is the golden age of superhero movies, I'm telling you. So... Uh, just by the way, so growing up in the 90s, we always wondered, you know, who could play these movies? Could these movies even be made? And now they're getting made all the time. And so you may be here today and you're like, wow, I really wish he would talk about some of these indie movies because I watch real movies. And I'm just so excited about superhero movies. So uh, I hope you are too. And, um, but we just love these movies. And even though we watch these movies with these fantastic powers and these things that are just out of the world, in a lot of ways, they're really, they are like science fiction movies. I mean, they're just so fantastic. And yet there's something incredibly relatable about these movies. 
Because even as we watch these movies with, with these superheroes, there's something about them that reminds us that, that, well, our world is still in need of heroes. That as we watch these movies, we, they remind us that, that really, that you and I can see ourselves in these movies. That we're invited into this, to this place where we could see ourselves as Peter Parker and Bruce Wayne and Clark Kent and, and Diana Prince. I mean, we can see ourselves in these places. And while we might not have, you know, great powers and great responsibility, we're, we're invited to, to really to see ourselves as these heroes, to see ourselves not as just average, ordinary people, but the kind of people that would risk all that they are in service and in helping other people to make a difference in other people's lives. And of course, we look around us and we would say, well, we have heroes all around us. We have police officers, firemen, servicemen who go and serve us, and they are our heroes, and that's true. But our world is desperately in need of heroes. However we might define heroes, however we might describe them, and oftentimes we would never say about ourselves that we're heroes, and yet these movies kind of tug at us in this place that I think is a part of God's invitation to us to make a difference in our world that's in broken and in need of heroes, in need of people who are willing to say, I'm willing to stand against the status quo. I'm willing to risk all that I have to make a difference in one life, even if it's just one other person. That a hero not only sees what needs to be done, because a lot of us can see what needs to be done, but a hero is willing to act, to take a chance, to step out there, maybe even stand alone. Because our heroes are not just about powers, but they're about purpose and about identity. And we see this in and one of our most iconic superheroes we have, which is really our first superhero we've ever really had in our culture, and that is Superman. And in 1939, we have Action Comics number one, which was the debut of Superman. But Superman was created in 1938 in, in kind of Depression-era America, where not only in America you had the Depression era, but you had the rise of Nazism. And, and Superman was created by two teenage boys, Jerry Shugel and Joe Schumacher. And in this, they envisioned a superhero that, that would stand against the oppression of their time, that, that would really just be a superman, who, who maybe was, was strong enough to maybe lift a car, but, and maybe to leap a building in a single bound, but, but this hero would just stand against the injustices of our world, that would, would stand against those who, who would cheat, those who would who would thieve and rob, those who would abuse other people, that this is the kind of hero that they envisioned. And it wasn't just an abstract hero. But Jerry Siegel, who's one of the creators, had lost his father a couple of years before when an armed robber robbed their family store and shot and killed his father because he was intimately familiar with how our world is in need of heroes. And so in creating the hero Superman, they drew upon something that had influenced their lives, and that was their faith. And so as they imagined Superman, they imagined him as a new Moses, as one who would liberate his people from his captors and oppressors, one who would be a symbol of hope. And eventually, as Superman's story began to evolve, that Superman began to take on more of the characteristics of Christ. And so even we see within Superman's name, the Superman's Kryptonian name is Kal-El. And El means God. In Hebrew, El is God. And so the, the name of the house of El means God. And, and Superman's name means voice of God. And the parallels continue as Superman is sent from his heavenly home of Krypton as a lone survivor to earth. The Superman is then adopted by his parents, who were originally named Martha and Joseph, but then was changed, because it was a little too on point perhaps, to Martha and Jonathan Kent. And it was there that, that Superman was raised and, 
And he began to embrace his powers, and he began to be more powerful and became more of the modern Superman we know today. And, and even in the 90s, Superman even sacrificed his life standing up to a force of evil that was just pure evil without any story at all. No backstory, just a pure force of evil. Killed Superman. And then Superman was then resurrected, continuing the parallels with Jesus. But in 2013, we had a new movie come out that tells a new origin and a new story of Superman called Man of Steel. And one of the things that this movie gets right is that it carries through how Superman became Superman. What it is that really shaped Superman's life. What is it that really honed his identity. Whatever, what it is that really, really shaped him to become a hero and to give his life for other people. And in this story, we see that Superman's story is a story of two fathers. His heavenly father of Jor-El and his earthly father, Jonathan Kent. So in this clip we're about to watch, we see a young Clark Kent who's just a boy and beginning to see his powers emerge. And, and as he rescued a, a group of kids from a school bus and it begins to kind of cause fear in and, and, and the people around him and, and even in his life, he's beginning to wonder, you know, who he is and, 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 and what is he supposed to do that he has this moment with Jonathan that begins to shape his identity. So let's take a look at this clip. sure the government was going to show up at our doorstep, but no one ever came. This was in the chamber with you. I took it to a metallurgist at Kansas State. He said whatever it was made from didn't even didn't even exist on the periodic table. That's another way of saying that it's not from this world, Clark. And neither are you. You're the answer, son. You're the answer to are we alone in the universe. I don't want to be. And I don't blame you, son. Be a huge burden for anyone to bear. But you're not just anyone, Clark, and I have to believe that you were. that you were sent here for a reason. All these changes that you're going through, one day. one day you're gonna think of them as a blessing, and when that day comes, you're gonna have to make a choice. A choice of whether to stand proud in front of the human race or not. Can I just keep pretending I'm your son? You are my son. Somewhere out there, you, you have another father, too, who gave you another name. And he sent you here for a reason, Clark. And even if it takes you the rest of your life, you owe it to yourself to find out what that reason is. In Ephesians 1, starting at verse 3, it says this. How blessed is God, and what a blessing he is. He is the father of our master, Jesus Christ, and takes us to the high places of blessing in him. Long before he laid the foundation, earth's foundation, he had us in mind, and had settled on us as the focus of his love, to be made whole and holy by his love. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ, and what pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. And it goes on starting in verse 11. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us, had designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and in everyone. 
You see, what Paul is wanting to remind the church of Ephesus and remind us today is that our identity is found in God. Our identity is found in God and the God that chose us, that chose you, who says to you, you are my son, you are my daughter, you are my beloved. And before the very foundations of this world, before all of this got started, I chose you. God chose you. And he uses this metaphor of adoption that that God adopted you into God's family. That God wasn't obligated to choose us, but God chose us because of God's love for us. That's why God did it. Because God loves you and chose you to lavish God's gifts upon you. That you are part of God's family. And so often we, we go through our lives and we wonder, you know, what is the purpose of our life? What am I, you know, meant to do? Just like in this clip that we watched in this Kevin Costner movie, by the way, that uh, just like in this clip that we watched where he says, you know, this is what you're supposed to do. This is your purpose. But really it comes down to this is that so often we want to know what our purpose is, but it comes back to our identity. That we want to know why we're here and what we're supposed to do, but God says to us, but first, you have to know this. You are my son. You are my daughter. And I chose you. I chose you. Because it pleased me to do so. That God took pleasure in choosing us. That often we can have this image of God that maybe God's angry with us. That God is distant from us. That God just wants us to keep all of the rules. That God's just waiting for us to stumble. That God's just waiting for us to fall. That God's just waiting for us to trip up. And yet, God is saying to us, I chose you out of my pleasure. I love you. And that once you understand this, once you begin to walk in this, once you begin to own this identity, it's then that you'll see your purpose. You know, we see this image in baptism. That when you come up front and, and you're baptized, whether we, we baptize an infant or, or a young child, or even if you're baptized as an adult, that the way we do baptism is it's not about our choice, but it's about God's choice of choosing us. It's about God's grace on us, that we say in our baptism that we proclaim that God knew us before we even knew ourselves, before we even knew God, God was at work in our lives. And that within that baptismal picture, we have the picture of covenant. And covenant is a picture of family. And the closest thing we have to covenant in our culture today is the, is the marriage ceremony. When two people come together and they proclaim that, that their lives, that their families become one. And in a marriage ceremony, they they begin with worship and proclamation to God where they say, we are making these promises to God and we're remembering the promises that God made to us, that God has chosen us. And out of that promise, we choose each other. That's a picture of covenant. And that's a picture we see in baptism. Because one of my favorite metaphors for church is family. Family. That when we come together, that we don't all look alike, we don't all have the same stories, we don't have the same histories, we don't have the same spiritual journeys, that that we all come, whether whether we have, you know, all of God figured out or we're just beginning our journey, whether we've been walking with God for years or or we come with lots of questions and lots of doubts and we're just not sure and we're trying to figure out who we are, you are welcome here. And at the end of each of our service here at Table of Grace, we say, you belong You belong, because that is God's word to us. Because once we understand that, it's then we can answer the question of what of our purpose? What is it that God calls us to? Because only then will we know the answer to that question. And that's what we see in this next clip here in Man of Steel as as a young Kalel has grown into an adult and as he's had a bit of a journey in his life trying to determine and figure out 
who it is that he actually is and, and what his purpose is on earth that he goes and he encounters Jarrell, his heavenly father from Krypton for the very first time. And it's then he discovers his purpose. So let's take a look. Recursive diagnostics complete. Guiding presence authenticated. All systems operational. To see you standing there having grown into an adult. If only Lara could have witnessed this. Who are you? I am your father, Cal. Or at least a shadow of him. His consciousness. My name was Joel. And Cal? That's my name. Cal L. It is. I have so many questions. you send me here? What if a child dreamed of becoming something other than what society had intended for him or her? What if a child aspired to something greater? You were the embodiment of that belief, Cal. Krypton's first natural birth in centuries. That's why we risked so much to save you. Why didn't you come with me? We couldn't, Cal. No matter how much we wanted to. No matter how much we loved you. Your mother, Lara, and I were a product of the failures of our world as much as so it was. Tied to its fate. So I'm alone? No. You're as much a child of Earth now as you are of Krypton. You can embody the best of both worlds. The dream your mother and I dedicated our lives to preserve. The people of Earth are different from us, it's true. But ultimately, I believe that's a good thing. They won't necessarily make the same mistakes we did. Not if you guide them, Cal. Not if you give them hope. That's what this symbol means. The symbol of the House of El means hope. Embodied within that hope is the fundamental belief in the potential of every person to be a force for good. That's what you can bring them. The symbol of the House of El is hope. So within this movie called Man of Steel, you see these echoes of how Superman finds his purpose and his mission is, is to be a source of hope, to guide humanity. Perhaps you can see how that is an echo of our faith. That as we look at the life of Jesus... That we see in Philippians that Jesus emptied of himself, that he, he gave up his privileges of God and he came to earth as a human. And he showed us what it is to live as a true human, to give our lives in service of others, that when those who were in need, Jesus helped. Those who were hungry, Jesus fed. That those who were lost and alone, Jesus welcomed into the family. And when there was injustice, Jesus stood up to that injustice, ultimately giving his life for you and for me, and conquered the forces of evil that we encounter in our world that we see all around us all of the time through his resurrection. And that is our symbol of hope. And that should inspire all of us as we've experienced the love of Jesus, as we know that we're part of the family, that we then go and follow what Jesus did. We follow him and do the things that Jesus did. That is our call. That is our purpose. 
So even now as our students of our middle school students have come back from their choir trip, when they go and they sing songs in nursing homes and they go and, and they lead people in worship, that they're doing the very things they see Jesus leading them to do. They're giving of their time and of their resources to lead those in worship. When we, we send off our high school students here in just a few minutes to go and to work in San Saba, to go to build wheelchair ramps, to go and to, to paint houses, to, to spend time with, with people who are lonely, we're saying to them, you are following Jesus. Next week, we're going to commission a Volt team, a Vision of Life team to go to Poland to help people get correction lenses so that they can see, so they can read, so that they can have a quality of life, the very things Jesus would do in our world. And in a couple weeks, our our Bridge Young Adult group is going to go up to Assisted Living Center, and they're going to spend time with people that are forgotten, that that live in the middle of nowhere. And they're going to go and spend time with them and tell them that you are worth our time because you matter to God and you matter to us. These are the things Jesus calls us to do each and every day. So when you have conversations with people, when you give of yourselves to people, when you give of your time, your resources, that you are following Jesus. You are seeing and doing to those that nobody else sees and nobody else would do for them. So when Jesus was with the crowd... The crowd that other people would see, but no one else would engage. And when the Pharisees came and they began to grumble and to growl and to say, he eats with sinners, he spent time with sinners, and yet, did you catch that they're the ones who are listening intently to what Jesus had to say? Jesus tells them a story. He says, there's a shepherd who had 99 sheep, but he would go to the one who was lost and alone and in need of rescue. Jesus not only was describing the heart of God, but Jesus was inviting them that would hear the story to go and to see themselves in the story, to go and to be that shepherd, to do the very thing that Jesus says, I see my heavenly father doing, that's what I do. And now that's what you should do. Because that's what it means to be a hero. To go to those who are in need of rescue. To be a hero, even for the one. Because the one is important to God. So who are the ones that you see? Who are the ones that are in your life today? Who are the ones that you're around you that maybe no one else sees, but but you see? Who are the ones that live under your roof? Who need a little extra time, maybe a little extra attention, maybe somebody to sit with them, to talk with them, maybe to do their homework with them? Who are the ones that you see today? Because Jesus called to us, is that we would go to them in ways great or small to live out our identity and our purpose and to tell them and to show them that they matter to God. Will you pray with me? God, as we come to you on this Father's Day, we thank you for your heart that you show us what it means to be a father, to be a shepherd, to go for the one, the one who is lost and alone, the one in need of rescue, because God, all around us, we see our world is in need of heroes. They're in need of a savior. They're in need of you. And God, our world is in, in need of all of us who know how you have called us and adopted us into your family to go and to do the things you've called us to do. Whether it's words that we say, whether it's actions that we take, whether we give our times to go on mission trips, whether we, we give our times to, to see and to serve those that no one else sees and serves, God, may we do those things. 
May we open up our lives to you, knowing that you've called us, you redeem us, you give us grace. So God, we thank you. May we receive your grace today, maybe in a way that we've never received it before. May you heal our hearts in those places that are broken. May you rescue us in those places where we're lost and alone. And may we truly know that we are your sons and we are your daughters and you are the great shepherd. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen, amen.